G'day everyone, this is Troy Hunt coming to you from a much more organised, formal environment this week. I'm at the NDC conference doing SSW TV for my weekly update this week. So it's, it's going to be the same sort of content, but it's just going to look much better and sound much better. Uh, and like last week, I'm with Scott Helm. Uh, you need to introduce yourself because this is now a more formal thing. So, okay, um, so I am Scott Helm. I am from the Cybers. <laughs> is this good? Is, is that, that okay? the North? <laughs> the North, yes, the North Cybers. Um, security researcher, hacker, tinkerer, uh, and I'm from Great Britain, as you can probably tell from the accent. So you're, you're here for NDC. We're both, uh, we're both in Sydney having done the first couple of days of NDC. Yep. So, I mean, just to set a bit of context, being conscious that this is on the one hand something that I normally do every week, and then on the other hand we've got all the SSW viewers who maybe don't see the background. Uh, each week I do a little bit of a chat about the things that have happened online during the week, the things that I've been speaking about. Uh, and some topical stuff. And it, there's just been a whole bunch of stuff this week, which I think is really relevant to people and really relevant yeah. to you being here as well. But for, for background first, so we're here at NDC, you spoke uh, yesterday. yesterday. What did you speak about? Um, so it was the title of the talk is What Lessons Learned from Billions of Security Reports. So um, for those that don't know, I founded a service about three years ago. It's a real time security reporting service. And we process now quite literally billions of reports every month for our customers. So it was a talk about how we've scaled the infrastructure, so the technicals behind that, um, how we've gone from literally thousands of reports a month to thousands a second, and also what we can do with that data at scale. So we have lots and lots of data, and that means we can do really interesting things with it. And what was that peak? It was like 15,000 a second or something, wasn't um, it? Like 16,800 16, and something per second, right. yeah. So <laughs> that's, and that's 16,800 JSON payloads. These aren't just like normal GET requests or yeah, something. Right. They're, they're HTTP posts with a JSON payload on the bottom. So it's a little bit more than just processing like a normal GET request. Um, so yeah, that's like, I'm quite proud of that, I think. That's a lot of stuff to take in at, like every single second and process. So that, that talk was recorded as well. All the talks here are recorded, uh, and that will be out in a little while. Yeah. And, and incidentally, this is the same talk you did in Oslo a few months ago, right? So there's, yes. that one's already out there too. Yeah, it is. Uh, so you did that. Uh, we're losing track of time because we've been doing so much. You did that Wednesday, Arvo. I did one Yesterday, Wednesday yeah. morning on I'm pwned, you're pwned, we're all pwned about... Uh, Actually, a combination of things, things that will tie into today. So everything from sort of dark web services through to the Nissan Leaf vulnerability, which you and I, <laughs> I was going to say, had a lot of fun with. I don't think that's We quite. did. No, well, yeah, well, honestly, we did. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a lot of fun with it a couple of years ago. And it caused a bunch of HTTPS stuff, and we're going to talk about the HTTPS mm -hmm. things. So, uh, but I was kind of curious, like I was showing you around Australia a little bit because you were from other places, and, and you were here on the Gold Coast in, when was it, about April, like April May, yeah. security. And we've been having a look around Sydney, and, and I, I have been amused at the number of things that you have found that have been amusing. <laughs> yeah. Sydney. And we, we probably shouldn't mention <laughs> what they were. this wouldn't come up. <laughs> just, just in case there's someone from Britain listening and then they get offended by something which we would just put normally all over the place. But yep. it is funny to see how many times you've seen things and go, oh, you wouldn't be able to do that in England. I have so many pictures, <laughs> like <laughs> shop signs and road signs and things that are just like, how do they do this? Now, without naming what they were as well, you did get to experience some of the native wildlife today, and I, I think they were, fair to say, delicious. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I might get in trouble for eating like, things. There's a lot of cars. Like, this is a very, very normal thing in Australia, but you know if someone else heard it elsewhere, they'd say, look, you're not meant to eat pelicans and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> eat pelicans. <laughs> it wasn't a pelican. <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, all right, moving on. Cybers. So back to, back to cyber. Um, so one of the things that we spoke about last week when we did this, uh, did this update from a far less formal setting was you had a blog post coming out about MageCart and yes. payment card siphoning off for... It's like skimming with yeah, JavaScript. Skim. So do you want to mention that briefly because then something happened like today which then sort of throws all this thing up again. So yeah, we've had this a few times recently where... Um, so like big ones this year, right in February, we had like thousands of government sites. They were hit with crypto jacking, which was slightly different, but MageCart's really become a big thing. We don't know who's behind it yet. I've not seen any kind of attribution on that. But basically, someone gets JavaScript onto a website that takes car payments, so generally e-commerce, things like that. 
And then as you're sat there typing in your credit card for the purchase, the, the hostile JavaScript is just siphoning that data off and posting it to somewhere else. So you end up losing your credit cards and ending up with lots of new ones like I have. Um, so I've had three new credit cards this year so far. Um, <laughs> I, I would have thought you'd which, know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got done on Ticketmaster. That was the first one, actually. Um, and you, it's like you just go to a website. Everything looks great. You know, it's all good. You buy concert tickets. It was for my little boy to go to like a, a kids concert thing. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, hey, here's a new credit card because Ticketmaster was breached. And uh, it must not have had an AV certificate. But the, <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, you went there. <laughs> we'll come back to that. It didn't take long, did it? <laughs> uh, so, and, and just to be clear, like when you say Magecart, because you say Magecart and it sounds like some sort of e-commerce platform. Magecart <laughs> are basically a group of bad dudes. No one knows who the bad dudes nope. are. Uh, we know that they've been very effective at getting script to run on pages. So last week we spoke about British Airways. Yes. And British Airways had been owned because they had one of their one of their assets, like one of their servers, had script mm. on it, which was compromised. And then the script, whip, or the, rather the site where people then went and actually did their shopping and bought their tickets, included a script from there, brought the compromised script yep. in, skimmed the cards, sent them back Off out to somewhere else. Uh, and of course, Ticketmaster, uh, that had an external, in fact, that was like a chatbot or something. An AI chatbot, yeah. wasn't it? AI. <laughs> so they got owned by the AI. But it was, a, <laughs> it was a chatbot that was integrated by virtue of pulling JavaScript into the page. That script got modified. Mm. Uh, and then it looks like with the, with the situation here, the one today, was, was Newegg. Uh, d does Newegg just run in the US or in other places? I'm not familiar with it, so it's not something big, at least in Great Britain. Um, it's, it looks like an e-commerce platform from all the news stories. So, I mean, I know of them from, from the US. I've not seen them anywhere else in the world, but they're a big platform for, uh, I, I think, predominantly technology-based products okay. uh, in the US. But we woke up, was it today we woke up to this or yesterday? Yes. Yeah, today. No, it, well, it was happening late last night. You, that might have been it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, sort of similar kind of story where, in fact, I'm pretty sure it was today, because the first I saw of it, someone sent me an email with the disclosure that they got from Newegg, which, which, in fact, the way they phrased it was like malware, and I was kind of like, what is this? And it turned out to be modified JavaScript on one of their pages. Do we still call that malware if it's modified? I mean, it's malicious. Malicious software. It's software. Mm. Anywho, so they had that running on their, on their servers that's being attributed to Magecard. I think Krebs did another write-up on that as well. So it's the same sort of thing over and over again. Now, one of the things that you and I were speaking about literally at the airport when we came, came down from the Gold Coast on Sunday was about uh, SRI, which is sub-resource integrity, the ability to say, I'm going to take my external script file, hash it, put that as an integrity attribute on JavaScript tag, mm -hmm. then if the script file loads, hashes doesn't match, doesn't work. Yep. And we were having um, a robust discussion with a, good, of with a good mate of ours <laughs> uh, about this. And I, I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of remember what his angles were, but it was things like, well, you really should be code reviewing the extra, the, the external code that you yeah. pull in. And you, you, I mean, I don't think either of us quite agreed on it, but what was your position on that? I agree with the position. You know, like if you have the resources to review external JavaScript libraries that you include, then by all means go for it. But I, I think that kind of doesn't address the underlying problem, right? Like if you code review this external library and you're like, this is good, we can load it, it has no vulnerabilities, but then someone changes it and adds a keylogger, then it's not like that's what SRI fixes, right? Like you can be as sure as you want that the code is good, but you don't know what code you're getting when you load it. And that's the problem SRI fixes. It, it allows you to make sure that you get what you think you're getting. So I think they're actually kind of separate problems, really. Like yeah. one is, can we trust the code? And the second one is, when we fetch that resource, did we actually get the code we think we asked for? So I think they're probably actually just separate things anyway. I think this is like SRI fixes a very specific problem. Yeah, I, I wonder if there was maybe a, a line of thought there, which is that SRI is meant to do more than what it's meant to, or, or rather more than what it was perceived to. But it's, I mean, it is, is literally just to say that this piece of code should always look this way. And if ever it looks different, then yeah. don't run it. And then to, to your point, there's, there's like a separate discussion, which is we should always make sure that external code that we pull in and that we, we might trust and we might not want to change is actually trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah. And so, then, but, but I mean, even then, it's like, how much money is an organization going to spend making sure other people's code is all right? Like, do you code review jQuery 3.1? Do you spend 10 grand reviewing jQuery? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, and I think, I mean, maybe some organizations do. Maybe, like, I just pretty much use all of mine from, I use the Cloudflare CDN to load all of our yep. JS in our projects. And 
it's like if there's something wrong with jQuery 3.1, we'll find out about it from the masses. Well, and, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's that's sort of a, a case by case scenario, right? Like I, I, maybe we wouldn't take that attitude if we were a bank. And it was going to cost us probably big bucks if you get that doing wrong. this video on our yacht if we were about to go. <laughs> <laughs> we'd have a different set of problems. Um, but if if you're if you're pretty much the vast majority of websites out there, you know, keeping in mind how long the tail is of websites, right? Yeah. And how many of them are using external dependencies? I I'm sort of with it's you. Like all which, of them. Which is yes, pretty honest, much all of them. You know. So let's. I think the, the argument there is everyone is going to be equally screwed at the same time, mm. and it won't just be you. So maybe it won't be as bad. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's like a, a a kind of a trust in numbers thing there, right? Like if if we're all using like the same version of jQuery, then we we get some like level of assurance from the amount of exposure it's got. Yeah. I'm certainly not going to start code reviewing it. And and it, it, again, to to be clear as well, I mean, a lot of the time this is, I mean, if I went out and included jQuery today, it's going to be a jQuery version that's been out there for. A, I guess at least days, mm. most likely. It's the sort of stuff that people are going to pick up. And I, and I don't want to sort of go down this path of saying you shouldn't code review stuff, but rather to say that I'm sympathetic to the fact that there are many organisations that can't. Yeah. And sub resource integrity at least makes sure that you do have the same thing running over and over and over again. It just doesn't give you the assurance that that thing is 100% legit. And that's the thing, right? I think we, when we say SRI, we need to really focus on the I. It's an integrity check. And that's. It. Mm. And if you look at it in that context and just say like this is literally just an integrity check of the file, then hopefully like people can understand its very limited purpose because it does have a very limited purpose, but it's also super easy to deploy and it gives you a lot of protection. So I think whilst it's not going to solve all your problems, it would solve MageCart in like the last three examples that we've seen. So these these incidents seem to keep happening that they, they do, for the sake of transparency, tie into the project you and I run with Report yeah. ARI because we do content security policy reporting and CSPs go a long way to, to stopping this sort of stuff. Um, also, and, then, and this wasn't planned, but <laughs> Pluralsight made uh, the course that I did with John Elliott on defending against uh, key loggers on, on websites, they made that course free this week because of the BA incident last week and then the new egg thing happened that wasn't us. I'm just <laughs> putting it out there. But that's, that's still free uh, on plural sites, so that's, that's cool. All right, moving on. Um, there's there's a, a quick little update, and then I think we're going to blow a bunch of time on this EV stuff. Uh, I loaded another data breach from a service called Nemo Web, which, which I'm, I'm taking a few guesses with because it is in French, but thank you, Google Translate, which seems to be some sort of news group aggregator which is for the most part unnewsworthy were it not for the fact that I spent two weeks trying to get in touch with them. Ugh. And I know that I've told you many times whilst crying into my beer about how hard it is to get in touch with companies, but like literally gone and grabbed the email address, the contact email address on the front page, which was also all through the breach, you know, hey, you've, your data has been leaked somewhere. Nothing after more than a week. You know, gone and tracked the guy down on LinkedIn, sent a LinkedIn message, burned one of my LinkedIn Connect credits or whatever they are. <laughs> you know, hey, you really, really want to look at this, got to, heard nothing, gone onto Twitter. Does anyone have a contact at Nemo Web? And everyone's like, oh, this. Do you think they just look at your email and it's like some crazy guy, whoosh, delete? Is that. <laughs> but, you know, there's actually a little part of me which is like, if they do, it doesn't really change the end result. And I've kind of no. ticked the box to win, okay, or, or to go rather, I've tried to do the right thing. And if ultimately they're like, eh. Yeah. Well, it would be a lot easier if they answered. It's, it's almost like we're, there will always be the same end result. And the end result is people impacted by the incident will come to know about it and it will be public and it will be in the press. We're going to get to that result. Yeah. Now we can do it the easy way or the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a cop the other. <laughs> do it the easy way or the hard way. And I try to do it the nice, easy way. There's another one I'm going through at the moment where I'm, um, you know, there, there is a two-way communication and we're trying to make sure that that's something that everyone's aware of as we go along and that will get disclosed over the coming days. But I'd much rather do it that way, but if, if they're not going to play ball like this, mm. it's going to happen anyway. Yeah. All right. EV. <laughs> I need something stronger. Oh, jeez. Um, so this is related to a, a very long blog post. It's more than 7,000 words, this blog wow. post. Uh, and one of the reasons it's more than 7,000 words is I've just been dropping stuff into it for months and months, just trying to, like every time something popped up and I was like, ah, oh, this is really screwy, you know, like this just makes the point perfectly, I put it in there. And, and the catalyst for finally publishing the blog post, which is extended validation certificates are dead, 
uh, was this week when iOS 12 launched. And the reason I wanted to do this with iOS 12, and, and you know this, but for everyone else's sake, yeah. is that in iOS 11, if you fired up Safari and you went to a website that had EV, like Have I Been Pwned, which used to have EV, we'll come back to that, <laughs> it would like literally say, Have I Been Pwned across the top. It would be the business name. And when iOS 12 hit, they've removed that. So you don't see that anymore. So now in Safari, it's, it's just like Have I Been Pwned.com and, and a little padlock. And that was the kind of the, the catalyst. Now, you and I have had many discussions in these videos and online and in blog posts about the futility of EV. And I, I kind of like seeing how hard you slap your head as I explain some of these. <laughs> so, so we might go through and talk about some of the points in here and then some of the other things we saw today. So if you're ready for a head slapping, that would be really good. Now, um, what, one, of the th one of the first things I put in here actually was when we did NDC security on the Gold Coast, Back in, and do you know what it was May? Because I can see the date oh, on the okay. now. There was someone in my workshop, in fact, there were two people with three machines that didn't have the EV indicator, the visual indicator in Chrome. Oh, yes, yes. So can, can you remember what the story was? Like, why was that happening? Basically, from memory going back to, back to May, they were, so Chromium was doing an experiment to test essentially the effectiveness of EV indicators. So I've looked into this a little bit more as the months have gone by, mm. and you have like normal DV certificates, as we call them, domain validation, where you just kind of get the secure chip. And then there's EV, where instead of saying secure in Chrome, it would put the company name. And they were doing an experiment to remove that for certain people at certain times and then track if they somehow acted differently. So basically, we have this big visual indicator. If we take that away, does anything change? So they yep. did, um, what do they call it? It's not a canary. It was um, it's like a, -B testing. a Finch uh, trial or uh, something. They had a, sp a special name yeah, for it. Okay. Um, and they were like, so what we'll do is we'll just take it away for these users and then monitor to see if that changes their behavior. Because if we take it away and nothing changes, then it's obviously not having any kind of impact. And those people, after doing some digging afterwards, were part of that trial where they go to a website with EV but get the standard DV experience. And then yeah. I guess it would, they were monitoring whether or not that changed their behavior. Right. So, I mean, they were basically unknowing guinea pigs. But, of course, the funny thing is, if you remember, because <laughs> you were there on the day, and I remember there was one girl in particular whose Chrome wasn't showing that. And I'm doing the, the, the workshop here and I'm going, you know, and you look for this and it says the company name and she's looking at a machine like this and she's looking confused. And I'm like, you know, maybe I'm not explaining it very well. And we go over there and it's like, holy crap, <laughs> there's no name in there. <laughs> and, and I think like that was one of those examples where it's like, isn't it interesting that here is a software developer who thinks about this sort of stuff way more than your average person and mm. the penny has just dropped. A very they technical person, this. yeah. Technical person and we're going to come back to similar sorts of things later. So that was that. Uh, last year I, I wrote a piece where I, I took the 10 uh, largest websites in the world. So look at my list here. Google, YouTube, Facebook, Baidu, Wikipedia, Yahoo, Reddit, Amazon, Tmall and Twitter. And they none of them, right? None of them had EV. Oh, that's funny. And, and, and of course, the funny thing is, is that you've got commercial CAs saying, oh, you know, you've got to have EV to build trust. If you don't have EV, they won't trust you. So these are the biggest freaking websites in the world. And, and th th there's a sort of slightly tangential backstory here, which is that certificate authorities, commercial ones, used to be able to sell certificates. <laughs> and then Let's Encrypt came along and totally messed that up because suddenly everyone deserved encryption for free. So we feel that they're sort of clutching at straws as their market has continually declined yeah. into the toilet. But that, I mean, and just to kind of add the backstory there, I think that was happening a long time before Let's Encrypt came along, right? Like the, the cost of a DV certificate has been erased to the bottom for more than, what's Let's Encrypt, three years old now? The, the cost of DV certificates has been plummeting yeah. long before Let's Encrypt came along. I think Let's Encrypt probably accelerated like the, the, the terminal velocity. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that... Even if Let's Encrypt hadn't come along, I think the, the cost of DV would have still hit zero. It would have just taken longer. So I, th I think that a lot of the Let's Encrypt angle is that Let's Encrypt has just continuously been the whipping boy of the, the big organizations. In fact, it's funny the way it's, it's turned around because remember when Komodo tried to trademark Let's Encrypt? Oh, that was yeah. fun. Anyway, <laughs> I remember one of the stories was the, you know, Komodo, the 500 pound gorilla, and that was the term that was used, the 500 pound gorilla because they're the largest issuing CA beating up on the little guy. Now, of course, Let's Encrypt is the largest issuing <laughs> CA and Komodo, well, actually, I can't say Komodo because someone got me in trouble for saying Komodo because it's not yes, Komodo, it's, it's Komodo, Komodo CA, CA, which is totally different to... It's a separate legal entity, which you should know from their EV certificate. So, you know, 
Come on, dude. Do you even internet? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. So one of the things we're finding is that there's just massive amounts of FUD in the representation yeah. of EV. And this is a lot, a lot of what this blog post is about. So for example, one of the things here is there was a piece that appeared on, on DevOps.com and it was, it had all the air of authenticity or it had a veneer of authenticity as though it was some sort of independent study. And the report, one of the highlights of the report says, a recent survey by DevOps.com found that customers are 50% more likely to trust and purchase from a website with a green address bar. What say you to that? <laughs> they teed themselves up for such a huge fail with that, didn't they? Well, they did. And let, let's start getting into where all that goes wrong. Now, one of the first things is, is that I think many of us at the time saw that and we went, this is not an independent study. <laughs> you know, like yeah. someone's putting money into this. And I did a tweet storm at the time. This is back in July 27 on this tweet. And I pointed out that on that DevOps URL, it, even though it never says it, or even though the DevOps report never says it anywhere, in the URL is the word Komodo. Not Komodo okay. CA, I just want to make a point of that. <laughs> so it was the word Komodo and I was like, this is shady. So I start pinging the guy that's written the report on Twitter and I'm like, hey, why don't you tell us who commissioned the report? And they didn't hear anything back, pinged him again. Eventually this bloke, Tony Bradley, Tony Bradley, sorry, uh, replies last month and says, uh, hey, my apologies for taking so long. I post a lot, but rarely look at mentions on uh, or replies on Twitter. The report was commissioned by Komodo CA. CA. Oh. So, you know, they paid for it. Now, um, th there's an interesting thing here because a lot of the report goes on to talk about the retention of customers and the shopping cart fulfillment when they see EV and effectively mm -hmm. about how much more likely your customers are to stick around, buy things, pay attention when there is EV. Now, uh, just so that I get a second opinion on this and it's not just my view, on that report here on the website, is, is that EV or DV? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like the, the actual Oops. report. <laughs> And incidentally, for the people online, there's like 2,000 people out here. So if we look this way, this way. Um, <laughs> so the report online uh, is sitting there on a DV site. And it's like, if you're so convinced that EV, you're like, you've just done this study and it says all this you know, retention and turnover yeah. and extra money. Uh, and, and, and just to rub salt in the wound, it's DV by Let's Encrypt as well. So, you know, there's that. Now, Maybe they should have just given them a free serve before. <sighs> There's, um, there's a meme towards the end of this, which is that the Simpsons one was like, stop it, he's already dead. And this is what, what it was feeling like as we went through. So, yeah, as we're going through this, the, the whole value proposition is look for, the, for the, the name of the company in green on the browser. And I sort of point out here that if you're in Chrome on iOS, no mm -hmm. name. If you're in, obviously now, Safari on iOS, no name. Uh, there was also the point that if you're in Chrome on Android, no name. If you're in Microsoft Edge on iOS, shout out to all the people using Edge on iOS. Uh, Wait, <laughs> that's a thing. <laughs> shut up and run with it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no name there. <laughs> now, um, as we go along, I just saw a question thing flashing there. Does that mean someone's got a question they want to ask? Should we do it? All right. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First one, do you like beer? Mm. Yes. Especially if you have some right there. Troy's favourite one is Foster's. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. Oh. Cheers, Eve. Cheers. Was that the... Oh, no, Second one. one. This is uh, an executive summary of uh, Mark Lou's life last week, one of my senior engineers at SSW. Um, he had a... Uh, he had all his accounts set as two-factor authentication. And he had his mail stolen from home. And now they knew his name, his postcode, and his date of birth. With those three pieces of information, he was surprised to find out that they could port his mobile phone number. <laughs> he then got yep. a SMS saying, uh, hi, this is Optus. We're porting your mobile phone number. He goes, what the hell? He calls up Optus and says, uh, I don't want my phone number ported, that wasn't me. Can you make sure you don't do that? They say, sure. He goes, can you write on the file, do not put my number? They do that. He finds out later that they couldn't have stopped it anyway because it's a, I think it's a, a, a legislation that they have to port numbers. So they can't stop it anyway once a request comes through. He then uh, finds out it's happened. He's very surprised mm. and he's very upset. 
and he finds out that they change his uh, Microsoft account. Because they now had control of his phone number, they changed the password. Mm. He goes, what? I, can't, I thought two-factor authentication meant they need two things. They need my password and they need my mobile phone number. Not one, not either. Mm. So he's really distressed. And um, then he tries to go into his Microsoft account to unlink his phone number. Too late. He quickly goes into Gmail, takes off his phone number, sort it. He's kept his Gmail. He forgets about Facebook. He loses that. And um, what happens then? I'm waiting for the bit where it gets to the EV. <laughs> <laughs> well, the but, site didn't have EV. This is why. It, that's, but, you know, there is no EV on Facebook. Either. But I want to just tell you what he's been going around inside the company at SSW saying. Two-factor authentication is damn scary. It's not what I thought it was. Um, what I suggest to all of you guys is when you go to your telco, you should tell Optus that your date of birth, which is the key, is a, essentially a password, like a few numbers different that only he knows. He's since found out that's actually illegal, but he still thinks <laughs> that's the right way to do it because it was hell for him, absolute hell. And when I think about the implications for SSW, somebody being able to get into everything of his, I'm sure Mark has breached a few rules. He's been known to breach a few rules. I'm sure he's put some passwords into Skype, et cetera. That would, you know, there's yeah. lots of issues there. I, I, you know, I, I think, because you and I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, so we, we know the backstory and I've had a bit of time to think about it. I, I think the two things on that that stick out to me before we go back to the EV thing is, um, no, number one, it's, it's basically like, if you have been to a birthday party for the guy, you have enough data to own his phone. You know, it's like, okay, name, birthday, phone, uh, address, which, which is kind of crazy. And I think that's really on the telcos to get that right. And, and the second part is like this, this wasn't so much a failing on 2FA. It was that there was account recovery enabled by phone number. And I, what I think the, the real lesson there is, is that you should disable any account recovery by phone number because the likelihood of having a phone number owned is so much higher than the alternative, which is having an email address owned. So we, we found things like the Microsoft account, you can configure it to do account recovery via another email address. So, you know, have a backup email address somewhere or the email address of a significant other or something, so long as they don't get owned, because then you've got a different problem. Uh, but yeah, take the, take the SMS off. I think that's, that's a problem. Mm. Um, just, just to keep this going, because we, we're going to definitely build some momentum on this EV thing. So we, we've lost indicators, or there weren't indicators anyway, on a whole bunch of these browsers. And, you know, we, we, there's all these quotes in, in this, this study. We probably should be doing air quotes around study. Uh, <laughs> around things like the larger security indicator makes it very clear to the user that the website is secure. And then we go down, and of course now Chrome stuffed all this up because Chrome 69 shipped a couple of weeks ago, and now nothing's green anymore. How can oh. you trust if it's not green? We can't. The internet is a lie. It's just, and, and we don't even have the secure chip anymore, do we? So it doesn't well, even say it's not green and we don't have secure anymore. So th this is the funny thing, and this will play in when we look at this other report in a moment, because all of the things that, that we are being told to look for, and, and, and in fairness, not just commercial CAs telling people to look for, but even corporations saying, hey, if you work in the company, before you go and put your bank account details into this site, look for green, look for secure, Ah, oh, crap, it's no longer there. And we should be clear, that was always bad advice, right? That was always like, bad. From the very beginning. But look for the paddle, yeah. Like a, but, I, well, any, I think any advice along those lines is probably bad, right? Like, because it doesn't, and we might come on to this, but it, it's like, just because a site has encryption, it doesn't mean that you're not having an encrypted conversation with a scam artist or a fraudster, you know? Well, so it, yeah, that goes back to the Barclays Bank thing, where they had their ad pulled because they were saying, look for the padlock and you'll know it's secure. And it's like, yeah, well, well what about the They said, like, genuine or something, didn't yeah. they? I think that's why they got in trouble. Well, obviously, you've got to stop giving certificates to phishing sites. <laughs> oh, <laughs> damn, we're going to need another beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, the story, let's not go down that rabbit hole. So it's, it's kind of funny, like, when you, when you drill into these things a little bit more, uh, one, of, one of the sort of recurring themes is that the objectives set by commercial CAs for EV are sort of counterintuitive to the good security practices. So things like get a certificate that lasts as long as possible. Yeah. And now, why don't you like that? Because you articulate it very well. Well, there's a few things wrong with it. And, and it's kind of like I, I get the, the commercial drive aspect from them, but there's, there's many <laughs> things 
like there's many things wrong with it. So like number one, this, the biggest one for me is probably related to certificate revocation. So if let's say PayPal get a certificate and they get their key and it's a two year certificate and I somehow compromise their servers, get hold of their key, it means that I can now use their certificate. So PayPal wake up in the morning, they're like, oh, we've been breached, we need to go revoke this cert to make sure that I, the bad guy, can't use that. And like all current implementations of that, in pretty much most browsers don't work properly. Now, there is like a small caveat for EV where pretty much most clients will check this, but in general, you want to avoid having a two-year certificate because if I steal it and it's got like 18 months to run, I can use it for 18 months and you can't stop me because you can't revoke it because the revocation is unreliable. It also forces you to use the same key for two years. So if you've got a two-year cert, you're pretty much going to use the same key on that server for two years. We, I mean, I wouldn't, I like to do key rotation kind of like a 12-month cap, right? Like maybe even less than that. So you're, you're binding yourself to using the same key. And yes, you can get certs re-key, but that's such a faff, especially when there's a process to go through. And if we're being honest, people just, is faff a funny word in Australia? Can I say that? <laughs> people, people just aren't going to do that. You know, it's like, we, we've got this cert, it lasts for two years, it has this key, let's just put them on the server and we'll just leave them there and forget about them. And so, <laughs> like, the, the, it's just the more you dig away at it, the, the, the more counterintuitive a lot of this is. Now, you just made the point that they want, they won't, <laughs> they, they, want, want. <laughs> they want the two-year certificates because if they do two-year certificates, they can sell them for a lot more. And you were like, I actually want to rotate my keys. Now, if you're going to do something more frequently and regularly, that would be a good thing to automate, but you kind of mm. can't automate that for an EV cert in that fashion, can you? Or even like an OV or DV where there's no automated process, right? Because right. some CAs, you still have to go through the web form and fill out your details. And it's like, here's, where do we send the challenge email? We'll send the challenge email here. Because not everyone's as, you know, not all CAs are quite as, uh, like, well-developed in their, their processes. But the irony of it is, I then see people saying, ah, oh, you know, I don't like this Let's Encrypt thing because I've got to automatically, I've got to get a new certificate every three months. But it's like, well, so what? It's my like cron job not gets actually a new doing it every three months. <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> cron job does it for me. Now, one of the other challenges, of course, is with an EV is you can't have wild cards on an mm. EV. Uh, but I, I did notice there's a fix for this because you can actually go and get oh, multi-domain EV certificates. And I kind of made the point that on Report URI, we have the customer name as a subdomain. So mm. we'd have, you know, I've got troyhunt.reporturi.com. Um, I, I actually did the numbers on the Komodo, sorry, Komodo CA website we could get one and just i just want to put this out there would you consider getting uh, a multi-domain ev certificate from komodo we can get 250 domains for eight hundred and eight thousand dollars four hundred and forty seven and twenty five cents eight hundred and eight thousand dollars and four hundred and forty seven and twenty five cents for 250 domains yeah it'll last for two years we need 250 10 two and a half so we need like 70 of those certificates as well if okay, I'm going to take that as a no, days. and uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> so scratch that one. So we $71 million certificates. That's, that's fine. That's but you like get a green... No, budget. hang on, you don't get green. Um, okay, maybe they're no good. Warranties. So one of the things that came up some time ago was warranties. Now, I remember... Have I, this is just one of these weird tweets where I remember where I was. We were pushing to get answers on what do you get for the warranty, because yeah. the warranty is one of the big things here. Uh, and there's, there's one bloke in particular here, and I'm going to name him because he wasn't very nice to me, so bugger it. Andreas Malik. And um, th <laughs> there's context. Bear with me. So he is the CEO at Cert Center who sells mm. certs. And they sell certs uh, partly on the basis of warranty. Like you go to the chart and it tells you all the reasons you should buy it. And it's like, yeah, warranty. And I'm saying to him, you know, look, can, can you tell us what do you actually get for the warranty? And I know this sounds screwy because if you go and buy a car and it's got a warranty, they'll go, well, you know, like if your transmission goes six weeks from now, like we'll replace your transmission or like yeah. it's clear, but it's not clear on certificates. We never got to the bottom end, to the bottom of it. I mean, what was the best answer you got about why there's a warranty? I mean, to be honest, I really don't, like, I don't, I didn't get enough information that I could reproduce it into a sentence, right? And I think it's worth pointing <laughs> out that this is still a super open-ended question of, so, like, I go to you and I, I get this file from you, it's a certificate, and then I put it on my server and I use it, but I just, I really don't understand what a CA can warrant against. Like, are they warranting against the encryption being broken, which is separate to the cert? Anyway, let's not go down that rabbit hole. Are they warranting that 
and this is the question, right? Like I can't really delve into this until someone gives me a straight answer of when would you pay out on this warranty? And I still don't yeah. have a good answer to that. Well, I, I would welcome one. I, I pushed Andreas on this and, and he replied and um, the, the, the way he very clearly articulated it, actually word for word is in terms of us, referring to us, they, uh, this is the CEO of the, they're a reseller, um, mm. selling these certs. He says, we are way too nerdy to accept that normal people have different needs than people in Nerdville. Where you, this is me and you, in your Nerdville. I'm done tweeting in Nerdville. Oh, hang on. He was tweeting in Nerdville. Was he there he as well? He came to visit us. He was in Nerdville too. I he just realized. <laughs> uh, we're all there together. And back to focusing on my customers' uh, real world problems. Uh, and then he blocked me. <laughs> and, and that was it. And then I went to his site to try and figure out what the warranty was. And I realized that he couldn't even spell warranty properly. <laughs> it literally ends with E-N-T-Y and it starts with a double quote. Why do you begin the word warranty with a double quote? But you do have a warranty, warranty. for one and a half million uh, with decimal place, zero, zero as well. Anywho, so that was kind of pointless. Now, one of the things here, and this will play into another observation a little bit later as well, is you did your Alexa Top 1 Million stats recently. Mm. You, yeah, you published everything August. again last month. And you found that we were up to... Uh, it's just over half of all websites you checked, wasn't it? That yeah, had, um, fifty something percent, low fifty percent, if I remember correctly. And to like again, because there's like a slight caveat with that data. So my crawler scans the top one million sites. It goes to the domain. So Alexa just has the domain, like Amazon.com, PayPal.com. Yeah. I go there on HTTP and see if they redirect me onto HTTPS. Yeah. So it's not whether or not they support it or whether or not they have it available. Right. It's whether they actively push the user onto HTTPS if you land on HTTP. Sometimes people miss that and I think it's important because there will be sites in there yep. that support it but aren't actively pushing visitors onto it yet. Now one of the stats I thought was curious here is that you found of all the sites pushing people towards HTTPS, 5.41% of them were EV. So you know, roughly one in 20. So yeah, first of all, it's a pretty low number, 5.41. Now that was in Feb, but then in August that number had dropped from 5.41% down to 5.14%. So EV by, by market share had actually fallen yeah. 5%. And, and when you sort of think about it, well, <laughs> it's kind of obvious because there's nothing to show anymore as well. And the weird thing is that we saw explosive growth in the number of sites with HTTPS. So you'd think that yep. like if the market increases and they're maintaining their share, which should be you know, I mean, for, for them, I guess they would hope to be doing that. They should be seeing the same kind of like steady growth. But to see that not only, it's not, it's not even like they haven't gained market share. Like you say they've actually so lost they're it. They're going backwards, yeah. So I did a, a small post after that, actually, of um, large websites that had EV and don't anymore. So I can, I dump my crawler data every day. There's like a two and a half gig backup file daily. So I can go back through and look at historic sites that had EV and then check them against more recent crawls that don't. And there was like government sites, police, healthcare, e-commerce. Actually, I made a note of some of these. So Shutterstock, Target, UPS, Visa, the UK police. There's, there you go. And, uh, and, and Twitter prop possibly, but that's a bit of a weird one. Uh, and PayPal, but we'll come back to PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Now, I'm going to sort of cut through some of this. Uh, one of the things I found quite funny, look, at it just goes on and on and on with the number of examples here. One of the oddities here is that in this iOS 12 change, the company name has disappeared. So that yeah. this whole thing of look for the company name, you can't do that anymore. Certainly not if you're on iOS on Safari, it's gone. But it is still green. Yeah. So I've got a, a screen cap here of, of Komodo.com, not the CA, uh, next to TroyHunt.com and Komodo.com's in green, TroyHunt.com's in black. So you should look for green. Yes. Unless you're on Chrome. Oh, not on iOS. And then it's not green anymore. Yes. All right. So, so even I'm what? go back. I'm confused now. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, now I get it. We're good. We're good. <laughs> so hang on. If you can't understand it, and there's not many people out there that understand this better than you, like how does everyone else get it? That's crazy. Now, moving on as well, because it's I'd, like, let's just keep killing it. Uh, there's, there's a few videos here that Komodo, Komodo CA, has been using to promote EV, and it's things like uh, Excalibur Cutlery. Like they're literally in a video, Excalibur Cutlery. <laughs> ExcaliburCutlery.com. And... There's like EV certificate and retention and more shopping carts and things like this. 
And then you go to www.excalibercutlery.com and there's a DV certificate from Let's Encrypt. So maybe update the video, Komodo. And then people are getting renewal notices for their certs. And there's another one in here from MostlyDead.com, which basically looks like makeup to make you look dead. That's not actually referring to EV. But you go to MostlyDead.com. That's a really and it's nice a DV, main job. It's a DV certificate from Let's Encrypt. Um, so eventually I, I said, look, yeah, it, it is dead. I deleted off Have I Been Pwned. And you were there when I did this the other mm. morning. We, we, we had a little celebration. Um, because it was kind of pointless. And, and the funny thing is, is that we deleted it and then we're like, where's the backlash? Let, no, no, let's just see if anyone notices. Don't and we didn't anyone. tell anyone. <laughs> and no one noticed. And I had 229,000 people in the next 24 hours come to the site and no one noticed it and they still came to the site. Um, now, just one quick thing on the iOS thing as well. So with the changes in Safari on iOS and also Safari on Mojave next week, um, like Chrome made some changes in the, their UI recently and lots of people lost their mind, people got really cross and yes some of them were buggy and they are fixing that but in general it seems that UI changes like that need to come with some forewarning, some like evidence-based approach, some kind of feedback to the community. Did I miss something with iOS or did they just be like this is our new UI because I think it's very Apple just to go Screw you guys. <laughs> You're like, we're just doing what we want to do. You know? And then, so then the question then is like, why did they invest time in changing their UI? Like, the, their developer didn't just wake up one day and be like, hey, yeah. I'm just going to do this thing. Well, there must have been a trigger. I, I, I think that the, it, it's a rhetorical question so far as that they know it's kind of no good. But then you could also ask the question of why did they leave it in green? Maybe it's like the Chrome thing. They just want to make small incremental changes. But they, And that's what interests me, though. Like, they must have... Like for them to say, oh, you know, like you just said, oh, it's because it's useless. But they, they must have had something to convince themselves of that. And was that just the the, yeah. the opinion of like two developers, or did they? I, did I don't they think do Apple's real research? big on going out and sharing all the information they have internally about how they make their decisions. And yeah, but it's, hey, look, moving on because yeah. there's just sort of a, like a couple of last bits on this before we wrap it up. Uh, PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> Explain the PayPal situation and how so this funny. all came about yesterday. So Troy Boo Boo live on stage and <laughs> he's like <laughs> talking in my about, defense. <laughs> in, in his talk live on stage here at NDC yesterday, he's like talking about the whole EV thing and basically most of what we've just kind of talked about. And he's like, so I'll show you what a website looks like with an EV certificate. Opens his browser, goes to PayPal.com and he's like, oh. <laughs> uh, Alt tab, <laughs> let's just like, and then you went to like Combank because yeah. there's a lot of Combank people here. Um, so the PayPal website doesn't, uh, historically has always, always had EV, which seems to be a, a really financial sector thing. Um, a, apart from yesterday when we went there live on stage and it, it didn't have EV. So my first thought was, oh my gosh, like PayPal might have ditched their EV cert and gone DV. So I inspected the certificate and they still had what looked like what should have been an EV certificate, but it was, so it was like an EV certificate chain, but it was getting DV treatment in the UI. And um, like you got me to check, I checked, and then we tweeted about it thinking, are we part of this Chromium experiment? Because both of us weren't seeing mm. EV. Yeah, two, two different separate machines, machines yeah. two profiles. I created a new Chrome profile, loaded that. Um, I don't know if that kicks me out of any experiments or not, but I was like, well, new profile, so it's not any settings that I have. Mm. Um, and then we would just like tweet this out, see what happens. And then loads of people started coming back on the Twitter saying, we see the same thing. So I was just like, okay, so they, they look like they should have an EV cert. It's a, it appears to be an EV cert, but it shows us DV and Chrome. Um, now we've not got to the bottom of this yet. And what time is so we're in like 7.30 local here now. So this is well over 24 hours ago. This is like yeah, 30, this is over 30 hours ago. Well over 30 hours ago. Now, uh, of course, it begs the question, how many customers have they lost? In well, the it's last... like 20% of revenue, right? <laughs> if you don't have an EV cert and PayPal doesn't but, well, make a lot of money. It, so. it begs two questions because like how many have they lost? And also, why have they not fixed this? How thing? important is it if they haven't fixed it yeah. yet? Because why wouldn't they just, if it was important, wouldn't they just go like, screw this, we're just going to go and get another cert? Yeah. And you think that, and it kind of like, it's, it's pulling my brain apart because I'm like, well, if this is like such a massive thing, an organization like PayPal would have just, bam, $600 for a certificate. It's, let's yeah. not even talk about that. Just go do the thing. But they've not, and they've still not now. And that's like not to have a jab at PayPal, but I just think that this can't be that high priority. This is not like service not unavailable or anything like this. You know, this is a little it's indicator that people don't know to look for. To see their traffic and 
transactions for this last day to see if it has actually had an impact or not. So I just know someone had a tweet pop up here. Hi, Burton. Uh, they, they said, wouldn't it be the OID in the certificate? O OID in the certificate. So do you want to explain what the OID is and why it may or may not be that? So yeah, so I, the first thing that I tried to do was figure out what this was. Now, it seems that some people have their browsers build different chains because you can't always guarantee the certificate chain the client builds. It will build the one that it wants, not necessarily the one that you want. So I was like, have they used, has PayPal used like the wrong intermediate? It's maybe building a different chain. I wish I'd had a lot more time to look into this. Speaking to people that we know, it looks like um, the thing that gives a certificate like the EV indicator is if it has a recognized OID in the browser. So in Chrome, Chrome has like a specific list of OIDs. So Chrome like whitelist IDs, mm, which will yeah. indicate EV or basically the, that give it, it the, has the ability to be EV. So yeah. like th there's not actually kind of any real difference other than the fact that it has a recognized OID inside it. Now, my, so shouldn't you just go and like manually add the OID? <laughs> so this came up on Twitter. So uh, like, <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, if you want this, if you want PayPal to show up as EV again, just go like into your certificate store with administrative privileges and add this OID back onto this certificate. And I'm like, just Job done. No, people should not be making changes into their local certificate stores anyway. That's just really not good. Um, but I'm my current chain of thought, and again, we'll know once maybe DigiCert will come out and tell us what happened, maybe PayPal will. My current thought is, was originally that PayPal had made a mistake, but as I've looked at this and had more, some more time today, I think maybe DigiCert made a mistake here. This could be that they've forgotten to do something or not done something right or like something in their mm. process somewhere has gone wrong and it's ended up with this certificate not being treated as EV when it should. So it will be really interesting yeah. to figure out why because right now it's not clear and nobody's saying anything. Yeah. Uh, okay, we well, know. it'll be interesting to see how long it lasts for before it's fixed and then how many millions they lost. <laughs> so the, the last thing, and, and you and I just noticed this today when we were out um, riding around Sydney Harbour on the ferry, there's, uh, there was a, a, a report commissioned by Forrester. Oh dear. <laughs> so, so this, is, I think this was in Trust uh, Commission, the report, wasn't it? Browser UI, what idea. does secure really mean? Well, for one thing, it doesn't say secure anymore, so there's that gone. And the, the, okay, I mean, you and I were laughing at this, like we're the, we're the first line through a nine page report here. But this came out in May 2018 after Chrome had already indicated that the secure chip was gonna, mm -hmm. the, the, yep. the word secure was gonna disappear. So w why you would put this out saying what to secure? It almost seems very tone deaf to what's actually happening. Yeah, we were saying this at the time, weren't we? Like, it's, you're commissioning a report talking about like terminology and, and parts of the UI that will be gone in the imminent future. And I, if you're paying for an independent report to, to like back up your position on something and then miss the like the really short term change, I wonder what happened there. And I think we've got to be clear because in this case and in the the, the other report before that that Komodo, I mean let, let's face it, bought um, th th this whole premise of I, I, in the blog post, I sort of likened it to if you're a tobacco company buying a study to show that tobacco doesn't cause health issues. It's the same sort of thing. You know, you're an oil company going, no, nah, it looks like oil doesn't harm the planet. It's just, <laughs> there, there's always going to be this vested interest. And, and I just, I, I cannot take seriously any report which is commissioned by someone for the purpose of illustrating the thing it is that they sell. Yeah. So um, they've got a lot of numbers in here. And <laughs> you and I were laughing, so we should do an infographic of numbers. <laughs> we are doing that. I'm going to We've got to do that. this. 82% uh, are concerned. Would you agree with that? Concerned of what? Like it doesn't what? matter. That <laughs> people are concerned. Excellent. Pe people, people are concerned. Uh, <laughs> I just love all the chuckles. <laughs> There's so many chuckles. There's 2,000 people all chuckling <laughs> at once out there. Unsurprisingly, almost all fraudulent sites with SSL certificates today are DV certificates. Oh, this really bugs me because that's such a cheap shot. Come on, let's be fair. But, like the thing that struck me is we just had the discussion how like 95% of <clears throat> sites doing HTTPS are DV. Is it then surprising that the vast majority of sites with phishing <laughs> phishing are so DV? Obviously, <laughs> purely based on the numbers, that would be the case. But and and I'm, again, I get this is like probably maybe a cheap shot at less encrypt because no, go on. <laughs> so. <laughs> The, like, let's take away the cheap shot, let's encrypt. Statistically speaking, you're right. Yes, of course, most sites, phishing sites have DV because most yeah. sites have DV. But then the next, like the, the insinuation of that is that 
if most fishing sites have DV, then if the site has EV, like you have a higher confidence that it's not a fishing site? So th this is a screwy thing, and I had feedback on my blog post to this effect as well. Where they're like, well, look, it, it is actually good. It will give you more confidence when you're on the site that it's not a fishing site. The problem is, is that what they're saying is that EV gives you more confidence when you're on the site that it's not a fishing site, but it doesn't give you less confidence when you're on a fishing site with a padlock that used yeah. to be green, used to say secure, still is green if you're in the right browser. Okay, I can't remember which ones they are anymore. But you, you know, you know that what we're saying, it's like someone's on a site that has all the positive visual indicators anyway, that because the other official site actually has EV doesn't change it. And unless you have like this mental mind map of every single site and what should be EV and what should be DV, in which case you wouldn't be using PayPal right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, yeah and this is the, the ultimate proof, like, because I've been sifting through PayPal's mentions on Twitter as well to see if there's been an outcry of people who aren't using their website. Yeah, or, I've noticed that. Like I was speaking to some of the Combank people earlier, and it's like, you know, if you've got Combank with, um, like one of the really cool domain tricks is get an R and an N yeah. instead of an M. And it's, it's like a one pixel difference. It's yeah. like, if I do that and whack a DV cert on it, people will just go straight through there, yep. you know? So the EV thing really doesn't help. And then even if you go to the EVSSL guidelines from the CAB forum, it specifically states that that's not an intended purpose of EV certs anyway. So, Look, I'll, I'll link to this thing when I, I put some notes and put this blog post out tomorrow, but I just, it, it is just hard to take any of this seriously, knowing how it, it just doesn't make any sense, and it's commissioned as well, which, yeah. is, which is the really frustrating thing about it. And it's, it's um, you know, frankly diminishes my respect for Forrester, seeing this. It's we'll commission our own. Does, ha, all right, let's put the nail in the coffin. Does Forrester have an EV certificate? Can anyone answer this? <laughs> I can't see because I'm on iOS. Oh, <laughs> no, hang on, it might be green. And I'm on mobile, so I can't see. Forrester.com. Does anyone have a PC running an old, outdated version of a browser that can tell us? No, it's black. Isn't mobile browsing like the, the largest It goes to go.forrester.com. Maybe they don't want client retention and higher turnover and shopping cart non-abandonment. Let's have a look at the chain. Okay, so I think we've sort of... Yeah, nailed that. Uh, to, to sort of wrap up the bits that I normally wrap up on, I've got a sponsor this week, which is Tech Fabric. Uh, so I've had Tech Fabric sponsoring uh, quite a bit this year. It's doing uh, scalable, reliable, and cloud and secure. Got to have secure. No mention of EV. <laughs> cloud native apps. So thanks to Tech Fabric for that. We, uh, because we're here and we, we've got this like massive audience, um, does anyone have any questions about, about the, either things we discussed or the cyber in general? Is it, has anyone got an EV? Around Are there any of the bank people here? Why does the bank still have an EV? Everyone's just like... Oh, yes. <laughs> we just hand our payments off to the bank, so everything happens on our side up until they have to pay. Oh. You've got to go live. Here we go. Um, we do everything on our side up to the point where they have to pay, and then it's the, the bank's job to handle the payment. So for us, we're just hopeful that the banks are handling the security properly, properly so then therefore we won't have a, an issue. Oh, so you have like embedded payment forms, right? Is that, is that what you mean, like up until the I point where you do? I don't work in the payments team, but that's my understanding is that, you know, you know they- So that's kind of like us then. So we, on Report Your Eye, we, like go through the whole process up until you get to the car payment page and then that's actually an iframe from Stripe. So you can't see Stripe's EV certificate in the iframe. So shopping cart abandonment. <laughs> <laughs> We're losing it all customers. comes full circle. So yeah, I guess like at that point we hand off as well and fully rely on our payment processor to do everything for us. But so, so we're hoping this the banks know what they're talking about and that they're it, but I, I guess, being devil's advocate, if they don't, they're kind of accountable as well, aren't they? As long as you've done everything right for your part, then exactly. I guess they they're are. They're more likely to get it right than we are. Yeah, and, and I mean, that, that's not to be derogatory about you as well, but it's like, that's their business. What they do yeah. is they build these things and then they roll them out among you know, thousands of organisations. Um, so they're responsible for that component. And... Uh, and it's actually interesting. I mean, we should talk about that because I was thinking about the mage cart thing where they're putting key loggers on pages. But if you've got the payment form in an iframe and then the parent page is owned, then that shouldn't have access to the DOM of the child element, should it, when you're entering your data in there? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So if you, you can isolate the, the payment forms off. So they, they're running, 
so they're not. I haven't looked at the BA payment page actually. But that's a good point. I, they they won't have been iframing it off. I, I suspect BA was accepting payments on the primary page, and then the script was pulled in externally into that. Yeah, and executed all, all within the same sandbox of that page. Yeah, that's mm. an interesting yeah. thought. So none of these so far will have probably been using like a, an iframe for the, I for the payment forms. I suspect not. Um, plus, the likes of Ticketmaster as well are big enough. I, I mean, they if, if it's us with Report yeah. URI, I I'm not sure where you work, but you know, many organisations are going to like. I just want to sandbox the whole thing and just give it off to the to the bank or them, you know. And that's usually just a convenience thing, right? Because that's you know that's kind of what it was for us. We need to accept yeah. car payments. We're not a payment processor, and we don't want to be. So we'll do the PCI like, thing. We'll find yeah. someone that's good at this and just bring them in and and drop them in. Yeah. Hmm. Any others? All right. Well, I think we, we did go on quite a bit about the <laughs> EV. <Excuse me>. Oops. <laughs> I reckon we'll we'll be doing this in like twelve months from now, and then we'll go. Remember when they used to be EV? <laughs> that was a thing. Oh, are you calling it? Uh, We've got this. On I, look, I don't know if it'll be twelve months or twenty-four months oh, or, or what it is. Did you see that? I. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Because someone will make a note in their diary, and it'll be like twelve months from now, Troy. You said NDC Sydney, Sydney. Yeah. two thousand. 19, there we go. Maybe it will. I tell you what, I reckon there will be more visual differences in browsers because this is the one thing we're seeing, right? Like they're just continuously changing. Mm. Even think about how much changed in Chrome, like just since January last year when they started doing yeah. not secure on, on card pages and now it's like absolutely everywhere and they're starting to go red and things like that. And all we've, all we've really seen so far apart from one snippet is like the dialing, the dialing back of positive. In the next 12 months, we're going to see like the dialing up of Ramping negative, of negative big time. Yeah, yeah. 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 that'll be really red. good. All right. Well, hey, thanks for watching, everyone. This is, uh, I guess, a different format, but uh, I hope it was good and it was useful. Uh, I'll put this in a blog tomorrow, uh, which will be Friday my time, and I'll put a whole bunch of notes and links and things to this stuff in there as well. And yeah, thanks for thanks for coming, mate. You're off to England on Saturday too. Saturday morning. So yeah. We won't do this again till probably January. Uh, for NDC London, right? NDC London. Yes. Yeah, there we go. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. Bye.